All right. Uh, so by popular demand here, we're going to have a screencast on the abolition movement. Uh, so I'm going to go through kind of quickly in the beginning, just because we covered a lot of this stuff in class, or hopefully you kind of flushed a lot of these details out in class. But I just want to make sure that you got the big concepts of it. Um, so as far as the abolition movement is concerned, we're going to look at some big questions. So here are the big questions. Basically, why should slavery be abolished? A lot of them are going to have different opinions about this. How should we do it? If we're going to abolish slavery, how should we abolish it? And then the last parts, Roman numeral 3 and Roman numeral 4, are really things that we didn't talk too much about in class, but I think are important. So um, the common man and what's their opinion about the abolitionist movement, and then also the anti-abolitionist movement, the pro-slavery movement, and kind of like what's the Southerners' opinion, and how do they justify it? So we're going to start with basics um, with why should slavery be abolished. So if you look at it, it really breaks down. If you want to simplify it, it breaks down into two big categories. You have those that are morally opposed to slavery, and that's their reason for wanting to abolish it. And then you have others who are more, kind of fall more to the political anti-slavery movement. So we're going to start with our big moralists here. Um, so really kind of like leading the cause here on the moral side is going to be William Lloyd Garrison. Now, he's kind of like your quintessential abolitionist. He's going to start the first uh, abolitionist newspaper known as The Liberator. And he really kind of believes in it from a religious standpoint that slavery is just a moral wrong. It's an injustice to human beings and it's an injustice to the American democracy. Now, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, he's going to get pretty extreme with his beliefs, and by doing that, uh, he's going to actually ostracize other people who are part of the mo movement and really agree with him that you know slavery is a moral wrong to moral injustice. Um, so he's going to get very interested in this idea known as Christian anarchism, which is basically total equality. And American society is really not ready for this whole step of total equality with blacks and whites and men and women, and so. Because of that, uh, he's not exactly the most popular because he's a he's by, by their terms and by their standards of the era, he's he's what you call a radical. Um, so our other person who kind of falls into this category of moral uh, abolitionist would be Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass, he also was a founder of a newspaper that called the North Star, um, and so they're going to kind of both use their platforms and the media to try and persuade people to kind of be uh, against the slavery issue here. Now the last one over here you have the Tappan brothers. You have Arthur and Lewis Tappan. Now these two individuals, they're pretty wealthy and they're going to help to form the anti-slavery society um, that we kind of talked about a little bit in class. Now again, these guys are getting a lot of their basis from the evangelical movement, from the Second Great Awakening. is really kind of where they draw their base from. On the flip side you have political anti-slavery, um, which is going to appeal to a lot different perspective here. So you have Henry Clay and the American Colonization Society. Him and James Madison are going to kind of form this society. Now their whole take on it is that this is going to kind of destroy the Union. Um, so it's a very political standpoint. It's not they're morally opposed to it. It's just the fact that slavery is going to tear the country apart. And so we need to fix this problem before it ruins the country. And so you know they're going to get very involved with this. And you see the fact that they're not really uh, morally inclined to, to help black people in America. They really want to just send them back to Africa. That's their whole idea. Um, now, the James G. Burney and his other aspect of political anti-slavery, they're going to form the Liberty Party, but what Burney and uh, these other people who will form the Liberty Party are kind of believe in is basically uh, they want free soil in the new territories, uh, but they're trying to appeal to like the common white person in the north, and later we're going to kind of get into how they appeal to the common white person in the north. But really their standpoints here are more political and not moral. Um, so when you look at it, what they all share in common as far as uh, their motivation is they all want free soil in the new territories because they all see the extension of slavery as just causing more problems, whether it's morally wrong to extend it to the new land or there's political reasons for why they want it not to be extended. They all kind of feel like um, having slavery in the new territories is, is not going to be good for the Union. It's not going to be good for America and for our future. Now, they also disagree on how we should abolish it. So again, they're going to fall into two major categories. The gradual, gradualist, gradual emancipation, or what we would call the immediatist. 
or people who believe in immediate emancipation. So somebody like William Lloyd Garrison, again, right here, um, he's pretty uncompromising in his belief. You know, he believes totally in you know, immediate emancipation. Now these other guys agree with him, like Lewis Tappan and you know, the Anti-Slavery Society in America and Frederick Douglass, they also believe in immediate emancipation, but they're a little bit more willing to compromise if, if need be, to kind of, if you know, a law were to come up that they could abolish slavery and they could do it in a gradual sense, um, these guys would be more willing to compromise and more willing to be on board with this. Um, same thing with James G. Bernie, that's why I kind of put him in the middle. What they really want, they do want immediate emancipation, but they know that that might be a tough sell for most Americans in the country, and so they might have to kind of sway themselves to gradual emancipation. Now the classic example of the gradual emancipation um, is going to be uh, Henry Clay and James Madison and the other people who are members of the American Colonization Society. Because what they want is gradual emancipation along with monetary compensation for slave owners. And they want to do this process because they feel like this is going to be the best for the country, best economically um, for the people in the South, and it's going to cause the least problems. Now, like we said before, they also want to send all of the freed slaves back to Africa, uh, and they, they actually form a colony called Liberia, and it's still a country today. And so that's kind of like their whole perspective. So what you want to kind of get out of this is that the abolitionist movement is very layered. You have very extreme radicals like Garrison, um, and to a certain extent, like tap, the Tappan brothers. But then you have other people who are kind of in it for more political reasons. Um, and they range from gradual to immediate, um, believing in what's the right way to kind of emancipate the slaves. Because some of them are looking at it, you know, that you just have to get, it, get rid of slavery now. And other people are looking at it from a more practical sense. And we have experience with gradual emancipation, and it worked in the North on a much smaller scale. So other people are going to kind of look to that and say, well, the northern states once had slavery, and they were able to get rid of it in a gradual sense, and it was successful. Now, what I think is very important is to understand what the common man thinks on um, this whole idea of popular sovereignty and the common person matters. Remember, these things that we talk about in class, they don't happen just because they're in one chapter, let's say chapter 10 and then chapter 12, doesn't mean that they're happening at different time periods. So that whole movement of Jacksonian democracy where with the common man thinks is important. The abolitionist movement is going on at the same time that cotton is growing in the South. You know, so these things are going on at the same time, social things and political things. And so it does matter what the common man thinks because increasingly p politics is revolving around the common person. So what we have to kind of get out of this is, well, what does the common northerner think? And the common northerner who can vote is a white male, right? In the North, so we have to know what do they think about this whole abolitionist movement. And so honestly, for the most part, what you're going to see here is a lot of white apathy towards abolitionist movement and the slaves' plight in the South. They're not too involved in it, and they don't really care too much about the situation. So what they have to do, just like with the democratic process, they have to kind of convince them to get out and vote and try and convince them by campaigning to kind of get involved in the democratic process. What the abolitionist movement is trying to do is try and persuade, you know, white people to care about this issue um, that's facing the nation. Now, the best way to do it is not going to be through like William Lloyd Garrison or Frederick Douglass using the morality aspect. You might get some people through the morality aspect because remember, again, this is the era of the Second Great Awakening. So some people are really experiencing this religious fervor in the nation. But for your common working class man in the North, the way that you're going to do it is going to basically appeal to um, their sense of rights as an American citizen. So it might sound counterintuitive, um, but what they're going to say is that slavery actually infringes upon the free white man's rights in America. So what do they mean by this? Basically what they mean is that if you have a white man who owns slaves, and a white man who's a yeoman farmer. And they're going to try and inhabit, let's say, the, this new territory, let's say Kansas, because Kansas is going to be you know, where a huge conflict is going to break out. And they have to compete with each other economically. You know, the slave owner and the yeoman farmer. Who's going to win out? You know, who's going to make more money? Who's going to kind of profit and kind of be able to buy more land? 
slave owner because he has an unfair advantage over the common white person. And so they're going to kind of use this ideology, which does make sense, and because this is the best way to kind of get the common white person to care about it. Because when you look at it, the working class white man, the common man in the North, is kind of nervous that, you know, first of all, they're, for a lot of them, it's just like a, a foreign issue. It's not something that really, like, hits home to them. So you have to make it an issue that kind of is important to them. The second thing is that if they do free the slaves, they, they have potentially can be a lot of competition as far as work is concerned for these um, working class white people. And so they're nervous about that. So they have to kind of frame it in a way that's very patriotic in the sense that it's infringing upon their rights. And then also, you know, basically, uh, again, appealing to their sense of entitlement that, you know, it is a white country and therefore these people should have all of their rights protected. Now, on the opposite side, which we didn't get a chance to talk about in class really at all, is kind of these anti-abolitionist people and the, by default pro-slavery people. So why should we keep slavery? Their, in, their arguments are very interesting. Um, there's huge holes in their arguments, but we're going to kind of talk about them anyway because it's important to understand you know, where the Southerners are coming from and even the Northerners who are pro-slavery. You have a lot of Northerners who are pro-slavery as well. Um, Specifically, like New York City, we're known as like basically they call us like the most southern northern city because we're kind of linked in with slavery in a lot of ways. So they're going to appeal to a lot of the same things that the moralists are going to appeal to in the abolitionist movement. And what they're going to say is that, well, in actuality, having slaves is almost like the moral superior thing to do. It's the Christian thing to do. So where are they coming up with this whole ideology? Well. What they're coming from is an idea known as paternalism. And what this means is that basically, like the slave owner, we have this depiction that a slave owner is treating his slaves horribly and abusing his slaves. What the Southerners are going to say is that that's not the case at all. You know, the average slave owner is treating his slaves very well, almost treating them like their family. You know, and there's kind of a lot of racism involved in this because they're kind of saying that, well, the slave owners, the white people who own the slaves, are kind of like their, their parents. And these slaves are almost like children, and they're they're taking care of them, um, and you know basically looking out for the slaves, which in some cases, in some extreme cases, might have been the case. In the other extreme cases, you know they're getting completely abused and treated horribly. And then there's that middle ground, and there's of course you have to think about rights throughout this that there one human being is owning another human being. Now. What the Southerners are going to say, again, they're going to appeal to this common man mentality that if you deny us the right to own slaves, it's an infringement upon my rights. Um, like life, liberty, and property, like John Locke, that whole idea that you have certain inalienable rights. And so they, the Southerners interpret the Constitution and interpret those ideas as, well, owning another person is part of my rights that I'm given as an American. And you can't take that away. You can't abolish it. They have come to take it as part of their rights as people in the United States. So it's interesting how the political anti-slavery movement in the North and then Southerners are using very similar arguments. They're both using religion to justify it, and they're both using um, this idea of you know white male rights and infringing upon their rights to justify their cause, even though it's totally different, totally opposite causes. Now, the other thing that they make, which is an interesting comparison, is they're going to say, well, when you look at Northerners and Southerners, they're going to basically tell the Northerners, you know, don't preach to us like your moral superiors to us. You know, you have slaves too, you just don't call them slaves. But they're going to, the Southerners are going to call the Northern immigrants basically wage slaves. That they work for a wage, they own no land, um, they're going to tell them that they're treated worse than the slaves in the South, and so therefore, you have no moral superiority to preach about our situation when you basically have the same thing going on in your northern cities. Now, when you look at this, you're going to kind of equate, they try to equate basically African Americans and the new immigrants kind of on the same level. And so there's tons of racism going on here and kind of the way that they perceive these different groups. All right. Um, so hopefully that clarified things um, from class, and you know, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow in class.